Great. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to this month's Patient Safety Movement Foundation webinar. Um, today's topic will be focused on patient, medical, and legal perspectives of unsafe care. Um, before we get started, my name is Sarah Miller. I'm our Director of Partnerships with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, and I'm very excited and honored to facilitate today's webinar. So we'll jump into the objectives really quickly. Um, so these are the objectives for today. Um, I will read through them for you all. Um, the first one is understand the different priorities and perspectives of patients, families, clinicians, administrators, and attorneys when dealing with medical harm. The second is recognize how medical errors have historically been handled and why there are such disparities in the way different roles typically respond. Third, consider the impact the current methods of dealing with medical error has on patients, families, and others. The fourth one, discuss the expectations that patients and families should have of healthcare organizations in preventing harm before it occurs and how they can participate in keeping themselves safe. And finally, summarize the steps everyone can take to improve communication, transparency, and respect for each other in dealing with harm when it occurs. So moving on to the CE slide. So today we're really excited to offer board certified patient advocates um, CE credit, BCPA. Um, again, if you are in the live webinar, you will receive one CE hour. Um, so please feel free to email education at patient safety movement with any questions you might have regarding the CE. And again, it will take about five to seven days to process. So a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, at the end of this webinar, we will have about 10 to 15 minutes of discussion. Um, so up here, you'll see um, we have a chat feature at the very bottom and a Q&A feature. I did want to show the differences between the two. If you do have a question that you want one of our panelists to respond to at the end of this webinar, please shoot it into the bottom right where it says Q&A. Um, it's where the red box is, um, and if you have a, you know, a comment, a question throughout the webinar that you'd like to kind of have side discussions with other panelists and attendees, um, you can pop that into the chat. But again, any questions that you want our panelists to answer, please pop that into the Q&A for the end of this presentation. So moving on to this slide, we do have a fun interactive um, polling feature for today's um, webinar. It's called Slido. So um, during this time, I would really encourage all of you that are on this live webinar to log in. Um, there are two ways to log in. You can um, scan the QR code directly from your cell phone, which is on the, the, the right-hand side, or you can go to your, um, your browser on your phone, on your computer, and go to slido.com um, right here on the left, and then it will prompt you to add in this code. So um, pound 875-992. Once you type that in, it will take you directly to the live polling feature. Um, we have two questions throughout this presentation that will give you all the opportunity to answer live. But again, you will need to log in. Um, so again, two options. The right-hand side, scan your QR code, and it will take you directly to this link. Or join us at slido.com and put in the, the code, pound 875-992. Okay, so with that said, um, I will go ahead and pass it over to Luis. Um, I'm very excited today to have him be our moderator. So Luis, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah. It is really a pleasure to be here today with, with all of you, especially with this excellent panel. And my name is Luis Torres Torija. I'm a physician and quality and patient safety coordinator at the Hospital Español in Mexico City. I'm fellow of the Healthcare Safety Fellowship of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. I've been in this role for the last couple of years, and I'm really excited to continue learning and facilitate ways to give a better attention to our patients. So with that, I'm going to introduce our fabulous panelists. I'm going to ask everyone to briefly introduce themselves. Do you want to start, Colin? Sure. Uh, thanks, Luis. So my name is Colin May. I'm a lawyer in Calgary, uh, Alberta, Canada, and I practice primarily in uh, state planning and uh, corporate uh, law. Uh, however, I also do some work uh, in uh, professional discipline. And I currently am a commissioner with the Alberta Human Rights uh, Commission and Tribunal, 
as well as a member of the Provincial Council of the College of Physicians of Surgeons uh, of Alberta. Uh, so I deal with uh, the regulatory element uh, for doctors here in Alberta. And uh, I'm, uh, I've become, uh, through a, a family event, I became involved in patient safety uh, uh, from numerous aspects, regulatory, uh, dealing with adverse events, and uh, from the legal side. First, thank you, Colin. Uh, how about yourself, Elizabeth? Good morning, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Caveney. I'm an attorney as well. I'm the managing partner uh, and senior trial lawyer at Caveney and Kroll, a law firm in Chicago. Um, I specialize um, primarily in medical malpractice, so um, deal with the eight issues of improper medical care or unsafe medical care very often. Um, I have been an ambassador to the um, Patient Safety Movement Foundation for a little over a year now, and am working to improve patient safety in multiple venues. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank and, you. And, and Regina? Hi, I'm Regina Holliday. I am a patient rights activist. I've been working on this field for 11 years at this point due to my husband's medical care in 2009 and his subsequent death. I started a series of murals about how to improve healthcare in 2009 and became part of the affordable health care debate. And then I began painting hundreds of jackets with people's patient stories, and that's called the walking gallery in an attempt to change healthcare policy on a local as well as national scale. I'm currently in seminary and I do serve at four churches and am currently in my chaplaincy at WVU um, Medicine in Morgantown, West Virginia. I live in Grantsville, Maryland, in Western Maryland, by Pennsylvania and West Virginia. Well, wonderful. Thank you all for, for this excellent presentation. And I'd like to begin by asking our audience to go ahead and use the chat box if they have any questions during the webinar, and we will review it in the final part of the webinar. And with that in mind, let's point ahead and, and get started. And well, as you know, the term medical error is a preventable adverse effect of care. Whether or not it is evident or harmful to the patient, this might include an inaccurate or incomplete diagnosis or treatment of a disease, injury, behavior, infections, or any other type of ailment. Medical errors often harm and sometimes cause death. We as a clinicians, uh, patients, administrators, families, lawyers, all have different priorities when something happens. And I want to ask Colin, what do you think are the organization's priorities in this matter? Uh, thanks, Luis. Um... I think for organizations, when an adverse event takes place, um, sometimes they have conflicting priorities. Sometimes it is to learn from it. But often the, what you'll find is that the priority is to uh, get over it, get beyond it as quickly as possible uh, with as little pain as possible to the organization, which often means not disclosing very much about what occurred and uh, not uh, being that forthcoming with the patient or with the patient's family, unfortunately. Um, and you'll often find that uh, that might conflict even with the clinician. Um, sometimes you'll see that, you know, the clinician who may have caused the uh, adverse event or been involved in, or the group of clinicians um, are looking, they often do want to resolve it. They want to apologize. Um, they don't like the fact that this has happened. This wasn't their intention, um, you know, and, but unfortunately, often the organization will try, will quiet them down. Uh, you'll end up with management bringing in legal who will tell them, don't talk about it, don't reveal anything, uh, let us deal with it. Uh, and so you end up with clinicians being quieted, uh, often families and patients not being given the information they need to find out what happened. And unfortunately, even for the organization, if their goal is to uh, move beyond something as fast as an adverse event as fast as possible, 
what they often do is end up dragging it out because they force it into a litigious sort of uh, environment. And unfortunately, what that does is it does drag it out for everybody involved. Uh, so often the organization is its own worst enemy in dealing with these matters. Yeah, you're completely right, Colin. And really in the part of the patient's priorities, what do you think are, are, are these, Regina? Well, as far as patients and families, when it comes to this regard, um, there are so many opportunities now due to open data access. I'm a big proponent of the Open Notes Project, which has been taking off nationwide and in parts of Canada, where we open up the medical records, the family and caregiver can see it, which allows us a little bit more access to what's actually happening in real time or close to real time. Um, so we get to dealing with these problems much more quickly than the traditional litigious way that was done in the past where it was shut down, defend, don't let the pa family or patient know what's going on. Um, which caused harm because honestly, in the cases of most patients, folks don't sue because something went wrong as much as they sue because something thing went wrong and they were treated badly at the same time. And that's the kind of frustration that makes people hurt for the rest of their lives, honestly. Uh, you're completely right, Regina. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to the audience members. And just like Sarah told you before, you can log in into Slido for answering this question. If unsafe care happened to you, how confident will you feel in knowing the appropriate next step to take? This is a scale of one to five, and being five, the most confident. So you can uh, answer in, in, in real time. And in the meantime, I, I want to share that available evidence from the OECD and the WHO suggests that 134 million adverse events occur due to unsafe care in hospitals around the globe. This contributes to 2.6 million deaths every year. If we took an account, for example, in the US, it is an estimated that more than 200,000 people die each year, making the medical error the third leading cause of death pre-COVID. It's now the, the fourth. And um, for what I'm seeing in the, in the responses, we really do not feel confident at all about what is the next step to take uh, when an unsafe care happen. And this is worrisome, but this is something that is happening around the globe. And yeah, uh, it's, it's important to take actions about this. And Elizabeth, I, I would really like your opinion on why is medical error the first leading cause of death? Does medicine has become some kind of business? Well, I think it's important for everyone to know that medical errors are the third leading cause of death um, in the United States. Um, and that's just death. That doesn't include medical errors that lead to injuries. Um, that, And this is only what's reported. So the amount of medical errors that um, patients are subjected to is an insurmountable amount. Um, and I think it's twofold. I think that the old physician patient relationship no longer exists where the physician knew the patient kind of from head to toe, all their health issues, managed their health, managed consultants that they uh, saw, and that there was one person that cared for a patient. So I think that's the way of the past, kind of the, the old uh, days of house calls are long gone. Um, but more importantly, I think that medicine has become big business. You know, you see even your, your neighborhood or your local hospital is no longer your local hospital. It's now part of a conglomerate, a medical system. And so we as patients 
keep becoming smaller in a bigger and bigger world that um, our care might not really be um, the main goal of the end person, which is a large corporation and a board of shareholders. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And finishing the question, we can see that there's really, there's a lot of less confidence and well, very confident is a small percentage. And, and taking this from an account, calling historically, what happens when patients point out errors and how do they typically respond? I think in this case, there's, there's sort of two parts to that. There's immediately in the moment uh, when you point out an error, perhaps to a clinician, and then there is the response as you move on at following the error. Um, and as Elizabeth said, what and just kind of tweaking off what she mentioned is if because you don't have the same access to a, a single doctor who may be your family doctor in the same way you used to, um, cl clinicians often work in large teams. Sometimes they don't communicate well with each other, um, and pointing out errors can result in sometimes they'll blame each other. Uh, so jousting will happen uh, amongst clinicians. And sometimes they'll, they'll blame the patient or the family. They simply start off by saying, well, you didn't do this, uh, you didn't follow your, your treatment, or they'll, in, if it's in a, an, an acute care setting, sometimes they will simply uh, say, well, you're being abusive to me as a clinician and uh, do you want me to call security or I'll call the police? You know, there's, a, there's often a very visceral reaction that happens. Um, so it can be difficult even in the moment to respond and then down the road, historically, what has happened is um, there is an effort to shut down the clinicians who may want to talk to the patient about or the family about what happened. And it usually involves uh, sometimes that DARVO acronym of deny, uh, attack, and reverse victim offender applies well here because you have a situation where it's often, uh, you often look to blame the patient or the family for something that happened. Uh, and um, instead of providing the information to them. So uh, as Regina said, that will get you very, very rapidly into a situation of litigation. It's often not the adverse event that leads to the litigation, but the denial uh, the effort to prevent families and patients from knowing what happened. So that's, that's often been what happened. And as that combining with what Elizabeth talks about, the sort of more contemporary or the more recent situation where you don't have access to a family doctor who can sit down and speak to you about what happened um, results in patients and families being left in the cold. So they have to find another solution, which often means ending, they end up going to a lawyer, unfortunately. Yeah, that, that's a, a very important point. The, the culture of denying, the, the finger pointing, the who's to blame in, in these kind of situations. And with that, Regina, I, I would love your opinion about the progress that we have made uh, up to date. Well, it's been a challenging time and it is a time of transition, which the beautiful thing about a time of transition is we can do amazing things. Um, as it was mentioned earlier, the hospitalist versus the primary care situation, um, a lot of people in the hospital setting have absolutely no idea what these terms even mean. <laughs> they don't even know who can be their advocate, um, what privileges are, you know, where, where can a doctor go in and advocate for you? So, so part of this is on learning with patients in the primary care setting about the wonderful resource a primary care doctor is within the family. Um, that's one of the reasons you want to have a pediatrician prior to actually having a baby because that pediatrician can be your advocate, understanding that the old system is actually still in place in areas and um, they can be someone who can help you. Now, as we go into hospital engaged networks and when organizations that are more focused on hospitalist care, then it does become much more important that you be a caregiver advocate or a patient advocate for yourself and understand the situation that you're currently in. 
Um, we do need to keep in mind that right now there is a movement called direct primary care. Those are doctors who do not work within the traditional insurance structure. Uh, they still do house calls. A lot of those folks do. <laughs> so, so it's one of those things that there are, that's another model that's being looked at nationwide. Um, and of course, with COVID right now, that has changed practice as well. So a lot of people are doing unique care directions like you didn't used to see nurses go out to people's cars and provide care in a car setting now think about how many accidents occur when a patient's just trying to leave their vehicle and get into the doctor's office how many hips are broken just because of a curve that was had to be reached right um, so the fact that we are in this point of chaos to some extent within healthcare is allowing for us to have some positive change. I also wanted to point out social media. That was not really a thing like 10, 12 years ago. So a lot of patients have realized that if they get on Facebook or Twitter and directly from their hospital bed, send out a tweet or a post about the care that they're getting, they will get almost real time response to the situation that they're in, which is pretty amazing. Um, when, when you can push your nurse call button and get no action, but when the Facebook manager realizes somebody's yelling to the world about the care and you get action, then things have changed, right? So there's a whole bunch of things going on right now. I do also wanna focus on electronic medical records. So at this point, most of the nation is using electronic medical records. They're using different systems. Within those records, there are pilot projects right now going on about how we could we include audio files about this patient? This is especially effective for COVID patients where the um, patient's often intubated and unable to talk, but that audio file can give a glimpse of that person's reality and help the entire team provide better care. The same thing goes for pictures. So if you can give a picture of the person as they lived, not as they sit within that bed or lay within that bed, but their regular face and their regular life, that puts you in a different place as far as understanding and relating with that patient. So we're utilizing technology in ways that can provide better care and lessen errors. Well, Regina, that's that's really interesting because you're touching this point of the information, the the transparency, and I can say uh, in the healthcare organizations, the the current data on, on patient safety is only estimates, and we don't really know how many people are affected each year because we don't have an accurate measurement method. There is really no requirement that the public be informed of the frequency and severity of all medical errors or the resulting patient outcomes. Organizations and physicians often fear being transparent with patients and families about medical errors that have occurred due to a fear of litigation or, or fault. There's really the there's certificates do not list the preventable medical error as a secondary or primary cause of death. It's only focused on diagnosis and physical causes such as cardiac arrest or sepsis, uh, for example. And with that in mind, I want to ask another question to our audience. You can log in again to the to the Slido polling question. And on a scale of one to five, the same five being the most confident, how confident will you feel in being able to get adequate information about the error? And I, uh, you, you can start responding and we will review this, these results. And I want to ask Elizabeth, what does deny and defend mean for the patient who is hoping to seek answers and how does it impact everybody? Well, look, I think we have to look at it um, in a couple of different ways. Really, to give the benefit of the doubt to the clinician, um, they have an inherent bias because of who they are and how they're trained. Um, they're trained, for instance, surgeons. They're trained to do a certain surgery a certain way and to take certain steps. And they do A, B, C, D, E, and the result is F. And that's what they're trained. And every day they do A, B, C, D, E, and F results. And they do it 10 times a day. So they have an inherent bias that I don't know what happened. I didn't do it. 
I didn't do anything wrong because number one, they did A, B, C, D, E, and F didn't happen. Something untoward happened and they can't explain that. And two, how could they continue to go on? How could they go to the next surgical room if they truly thought they did something in room A that led to the death of that patient? They have to think it wasn't my fault. I didn't do it. I didn't do anything wrong in order to be able to go to the next surgery and able to be able to wake up the next day and continue to practice medicine. So I think we have to recognize that clinicians have an inherent bias to admitting fault and admitting medical error. That's the first thing. The second thing, you know, I tell, I spoke at a, a conference of uh, laparoscopic OBGYNs. I was asked to speak about how plaintiff's attorneys evaluate medical negligence cases. Um, I was the least popular person in the room, I can assure you of that. Um, but one of the things that I said to the physicians is, if you would spend more time in your patient's room, they would never end up in my room, in my office. They will go to you first for answers to their questions before they will come to me. It is only when they don't get answers to their questions and they don't understand that they will come to a lawyer to try and get answers and questions. Very few situations are situations where the patient comes, they absolutely know what happened, they know what the error was, they know what the basis for a lawsuit is, Look, they're not all wrong, wrong site surgeries, um, you know, or um, um, amputation of the wrong leg. They're not, they're often very complex cases that take some time to figure out what occurred. But when they don't get that answer from the clinicians, they will come to an attorney like myself. And you might not like the answer that I come up with. It might not even be the right answer, but I will make the time and go through the education and the medical literature and the records and talk to the, as many people as I can and try and figure out for the patient what it was that happened. So the lack of transparency, whether forced onto the clinician by the organization or their insurer, or because of their inherent bias to believe that they didn't do anything wrong, the lack of transparency is what will drive them to litigation or at least to seek legal counsel. Yeah, I completely agree. And in the part of the, the clinicians, it's normal that there's some fear regarding the repercussions of error, that it can be from disaccreditation, legal problems, to even lose their jobs, where hospitals have traditionally follow a deny and defend strategy providing limited information to the patient and family and avoiding admissions of fault. But there's also, I, I want to share this, that there's a growing number of institutions that have implemented a communication and response strategies that emphasize early disclosure of adverse events and a more proactive approach to achieving an amicable solution. We have second victim programs to give support to clinicians after an error where the focus is really on the system and not in the individual. And about the organizations, I would love your, your point of view, Colin, about what does this deny and defend culture mean for, for the organization culture as a whole? As a whole? I think um, for the culture as a whole, um, just the learning piece is not there. Um, if, uh, and as, as you mentioned, there has, there has been a, a move to sort of quality assurance reviews, that sort of thing on a systemic level. Um, and there's been a good element to that and a bad element uh, we've seen here in Canada because um, there, they, there is an effort to learn from these experiences, uh, but often you'll find that that effort itself will cover up some of what happened for the families and the patients, because um, in Canada, for instance, in my province in Alberta, under the Evidence Act, uh, information that's brought forward through a quality assurance review, which is a systemic look at what happened, not about individuals, 
uh, can't be used in any other form. So it's protected information. Um, and when the meeting will happen between the, uh, for instance, maybe Alberta Health Services or some other organization that is responsible for the care, when that meeting's held with the family, they don't discuss uh, findings of an investigation, but outcomes of what they're going to do. So often you'll find patients and families are looking around, staring at each other thinking, well, we know less now than when we came in. And it gives you a sense that there is still a cover up going on, that they're not giving you the information. We have the same thing in the United States and that um, whenever there's an adverse outcome, um, most hospitals will require that um, um, a conference, a morbidity and mortality conference takes place where some of the greatest minds at the institution will meet, will review the records, will interview the doctor, interview the nurses, and make conclusions about what happened and how can we prevent this from happening in the future. It's a beautiful thing, but the patient's not invited to it. The patient's family's not invited to it. They're not, it's completely not discoverable in the United States. Anything that's generated or done at that conference is kept confidential from the client. Um, an attorney is entitled to find out if an m, &M conference took place, but we're not allowed to see any of the documents or any of the conclusions that were reached or changes in protocols that resulted. So it doesn't advance the cause that we're talking about today, which is transparency. Right, and I think yeah, that's exactly what we're seeing here in Canada as well. Um, in an effort to learn, um, and perhaps a good, I think a good faith effort to learn, yeah. um, organizations are still uh, perhaps it's intentionally and sometimes unintentionally shutting the family out from that process of learning by turning it into a systems error. Um, and of course, it, so that will mean families may have to go to a regulator to complain about uh, certain clinicians. Um, and it really, what I'm finding is it it actually prolongs the problem because the patients and their families don't feel they've gotten enough information from this systemic review. So they end up dragging doctors and RNs uh, before their regulator. So it just gives this pro, it just extends the process. So I think as Elizabeth mentioned, there has to be a way to bring patients and families into those reviews that make them feel as well that they're a part of it, they're contributing to it, that their concerns are heard, and that uh, they're not feeling shut out. So that, again, as I said, it, we need to avoid that prolonged uh, conflict that goes on, which just harms clinicians as well. Yeah, you're completely right. How how can we align really all the efforts of all the, the persons involved in this kind of events? And I want to ask you, Sarah, if it's possible to uh, review the, the results of the question. Thank you. This, this is important because this this one of the main things that we want to have with our patients and really all the healthcare system that we have in our different countries, of course, taking an account the, the different context is the trust. So what happened when we do not think we're getting the, the adequate information about an error? And we can see here in the response that 0% feel very confident about the, the information that they're receiving about an error. And the most percent is really the, the part of the less uh, confident uh, side. And related to the information, uh, according to studies, like the one published by the Patient Safety Movement Foundation in their annual poll in in US, for example, 87% of the general public have heard a little or nothing about medical error or patient injuries with an overwhelming support about creating more public information about this problem, with 82% approx in having more focus on promoting patient safety. So with that in mind, Regina, what can patients, families, and the general public can do about it? So of course, we're somewhat limited in what tools we have. 
A part of it is just embracing the fact that mistakes do happen. So in facilities around the United States for at least the past 10 years I'm aware of, there's been these zero harm campaigns. And you'll see all these signs up about zero harm, zero injuries. And is that a realistic goal, truly? Do we make mistakes? Yes. So right now this average is one medical error per day during hospitalization. So it's happening consistently. So when we ask people to have zero harm, zero mistakes, then I don't think we're realistic in what's going to cause understanding of reality. If we let the caregiver and the family and the patient be part of the care team, which honestly, prior to COVID, they actually were. In many cases, they were providing care in the room. Hospitals are understaffed. Now, of course, due to COVID, visitation has been limited. So family caregiving in the hospital setting is not what it once was. But if we're truly viewed as part of the care team, then we need to be part of these meetings. We need to be part of the M&Ms as we go deeper into a world where telehealth is a standard of care. Thank you, COVID, for making that more possible. Then we truly are part of the care team. And we have to be part of all these same information and same documents. When charting occurs, it shouldn't just happen from the care professor, professionals, but also from the patient and family themselves, because they are an understanding part of that team. When we talk about systemic problems within healthcare, it's important to remember that this information is not being shared often beyond the hospital system in which it occurs. Patient communities like patients like me and other Facebook groups are doing their best to spread information about systemic harm far beyond the current hospital system in which they are being treated. So we have great hope of progress and change due to what the patient voice can provide within a wider care paradigm. And due to access to information, we are able to spread more of that, which is incredibly important. Yeah, you're completely right, Regina. And yeah, how, how can we change this uh, paradigm about this kind of culture that uh, normally we have in our country? So Elizabeth, how can patients and family members prioritize their goals in the short term and long term? Well, the short term goal for any family or patient obviously is to prevent a medical error, right? So not even to get into this, what we're talking about. And the best way to do that is to have a patient advocate um, with you um, when you're dealing with significant medical issues. I don't mean when you're going for your annual physical or when you're going for your mammogram, but if you know something's wrong, you have been diagnosed with cancer or you've had a biopsy done and you're going to get the results, take someone with you. I've been a patient advocate. I'm not a pa certified patient advocate and I don't mean take a certified patient advocate with you. I mean, take someone that you trust that can take notes and can listen. I've been an advocate for both a medical malpractice attorney Attorney, a defense attorney and a judge on, on two occasions gone with them to their medical appointments and the questions I hear them say and the misinformation that they walk away from I think who are you were you in the same room that I was and I was so thankful that I was there taking notes for that person because they were a patient they weren't somebody with medical knowledge they weren't a judge they weren't a medical malpractice attorney they were just a patient and uh, I was so glad to be there to be able to take notes and information. So always, if you're dealing with something, something important or something that may be important, take someone with you, a friend, a family member, somebody you can trust. Um, if you don't have somebody, hire a patient advocate um, and make the investment and have somebody go with you that can walk you through the process and help you find consultants and go to the next step. If a medical error does take place, if you've done that, but yet something does go wrong, um, try to go to the doctor first. Talk to the nurses. The nurses are often your best friends and the ones that cared for you while you were in the hospital. Talk to them if they're available to you. Often hospitals and organizations will pull them and all of a sudden you won't see those same nurses that you had ever again. 
the doctor, the surgeon doesn't come to do the uh, follow up appointment and to see how your stitches are coming along. It's a resident only that does or it's an attending or one of his partners so you can't go back to your original doctor but try try and talk to the people that were involved. Um, I think going to the organization is a complete and total waste of time. Contacting the organization, asking for a meeting with their general counsel or their legal counsel or writing a letter about the doctor or telling them you want some questions answered, complete waste of time in my experience. The next step is to talk to an attorney and, um, and get, or get your medical records and have them reviewed by a nurse or a physician if you, if you have the benefit of somebody like that in your family um, or in your circle of friends. Most people don't, um, but if you do, that's a choice, you know, to have your records reviewed, but find a qualified, competent attorney. I have a nurse employed um, full-time. I used to have two. I would have them go through the medical records with the patient and so that they could look through them together and understand them. And they understand our decision on whether we're going to go forward with a lawsuit or we're not. So um, those are my suggestions on short term and long term um, fixes, um, although it's really a system that's broken. It needs to be fixed first. But if you end up, unfortunately, in that system, those are some steps you can take. Yeah, exactly, Elizabeth. How do we prevent to this uh, process uh, uh, happen? How do we develop distrust more than the normal uh, physician and healthcare personnel with, with the patient? How mm -hmm. can we improve this, this communication so the patient can be feel as a part of the team, this patient center? Uh, care attention uh, that is is it is is really useful, and with that, Colin, what should patients, families, and really the general public expect healthcare organizations should do about it? Well, I think something that Elizabeth has mentioned um, is, uh, and this we are seeing this more. We see this in Canada and Alberta. We're seeing this. Um, you're able to access your electronic records more easily. But as Elizabeth noted, most people look at their, their records and they have no clue um, what they're telling them. Um, so I think that is one of the areas where uh, organizations uh, should be more proactive. Uh, if you're looking at your records and you want to find out what they mean, uh, they're, for, for most people, they're very difficult to understand. Um, there's a lot of jargon, there's a lot of acronyms that you will never know what they mean. Um, watching, you know, a medical show on TV, a drama is not going to get you there. Um, so I think that's one of the things is just being more forthcoming with the information, uh, but also explaining it to patients and families. They need to know what it is. Now, that doesn't mean you don't end up going to a lawyer ultimately to find out more because they may not tell you everything they want you to know that you want to know or that you need to know. But I think having that access to the information is important. Um, and as Elizabeth also said, in my experience as well, um, one of the least helpful things you can do is to go to the organization and complain. Um, the complaints processes often are very opaque um, and they will not give you the information again that you need or they will be very cursory in their investigation um, without and not look to, to, uh, to lay any blame or to even explain what happened. So you're often better uh, in Alberta, we have various agencies. Uh, you can certainly go to the regulator so that or a physician's board, uh, the College of Physicians and Surgeons does investigations. Um, there are other agencies set up Recently, Alberta just went through a process uh, where we reviewed the entire complaints process across a number of organizations, uh, including Alberta Health Services, which is the key provider here. Of course, we have public health here in Canada, um, and Alberta Health Services is pretty much it in this province. Uh, they, are, they are the universal board that provides everything, uh, not necessarily in primary or long term, but what I would say is, you, you know, we need to have, we, we should expect organizations to be more forthcoming, uh, more proactive in giving us information, 
but also when they, I think what they need are complaints processes that are independent in many ways, the way you might have uh, an internal auditor in a company, you need a, a, a complaints process or an office that is not controlled uh, directly by uh, management uh, and legal stepping in uh, to allow people to make complaints and to get a fair hearing. Uh, and that's, that, those are the things I think we need to look at going down the road. Uh, and I mean, I mean, I'm happy that Alberta has done that. Where that goes right now, that's just sort of in the consideration phase. But I think those are the things we need to see. Um, and more, more ability to see what's going on immediately, uh, more access to those records. As Regina said, um, you can now go online, you can make a Facebook complaint and get faster reaction than if you go to the RN down the hall and tell her you're unhappy about something. Um, and that, that can be different, a, a bit different in Canada, maybe from the US because we do have government run healthcare. So um, the reaction is somewhat delayed perhaps, but I have seen many people who will make a complaint on Facebook uh, or on LinkedIn or somewhere. And the next day, uh, somebody from Alberta Health Services is, is responding to that complaint and saying, sorry, what did we do wrong? Let's find out some more information. So I think those are the things that we need from these organizations. Um, and move, we need to move forward with those. And we need to, I think, to get a sense that um, you don't want to, uh, you know, you don't, you don't want to be attacking the family. You don't want that to be the culture. We need to have that culture of, uh, as Regina has also said, their family was a caregiver. Patients had to have to be involved in their own care, the person-centered model of care which also means that doctors and nurses are also persons. They're all involved in this care as a team. Um, and you want to protect everybody because of course, doctors and nurses don't go to work generally <laughs> saying, I'm going to harm somebody. Uh, as Elizabeth said, they have a bias to, and then in many ways to continue working and to maintain their own uh, health. They have to believe that they're doing the right thing. And when something wrong does happen, jumping all over them uh, and harming them doesn't help the situation either. So I think or, or we, need that, we need that from organizations uh, for both the patients, families, and the clinicians. Luis, I would just add also, you know, at least half of the people that come to my office um, come with a, with the mindset that we just want to make sure that this doesn't happen to somebody else. They want to know that there's a check and a balance and that if something went wrong, it's going to be rectified, not necessarily compensatorily to them, but that it's going to be rectified for the next patient, for the next child, for the next parent, so that another family doesn't have to go through it. Um, you hear about it in criminal cases that families who um, that represent the families of the victim very often don't want the families of the offender to get the death penalty because they don't want that family to be just as destroyed as they are. Um, and it's the same kind of thing. Very often families of victims of medical error don't want anything horrible to happen to the doctor. They just don't want another family to go through what they went through. And, um, and, and hospitals and organizations very often are doing checks and balances or making a change in their flow sheet or adding a box that needs to be checked or um, adding a, a, a stop in the surgery where everything has to be checked, a uh, timeout. Um, but patients don't know that, that that's happened as a result of their parents' death or their child's injury and how good they would feel if they knew now, you know, call it Trevor's correction or, you know, um, and Sandy's uh, timeout. And, and it would be such a benefit to families to feel like they lost something, but it was at the at the cost of a greater good. A greater good came from it. Um, I think that would be something really wonderful to see from organizations. Yeah, you're, you're so sorry. Yeah, I was going to say. I think Elizabeth has hit the nail on the head there. Um, you know, certainly there are situations where people need compensation. They've been harmed. They have maybe permanent injuries that require lifelong uh, care that is expensive and they need to be paid for that. 
but I think she's absolutely right. Most people are looking at this as what happened, apologize to us, be transparent about it, and make sure it doesn't happen to somebody else, uh, or at least try to diminish the likelihood that it happens to somebody else. No, I mean, as Regina said, you know, mistakes happen. You can't prevent every mistake. But if you if an adverse event occurs because there is a flaw in a system or a technical flaw, that can be fixed, that can be uh, addressed, and uh, that information should be passed on throughout the healthcare system to other organizations, to, uh, to other hospitals. And that's what a lot of people are looking for. They feel that at least um, as upset as they are with what happened to them, that they're, you know, humans have this sense that if we can help, if we can learn from something that went wrong and make sure other people are safe and protected, then that's, that's an important, uh, that, that's a very important thing for people uh, to feel that what's happened to them has produced an effect where maybe a hundred other people will not now go through that. A hundred other families won't go through that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're making excellent points, and really, you're talking about the culture. You're talking about uh, patients, uh, families, clinicians, or people. So we all have fears. We all have. Uh, different ways to to respond and yeah I, I've seen some of the the comments about yeah if, if a healthcare worker say something about a medical error they will get punished something like that this is mainly sadly uh, things that happen right now and that it does not help to align all the efforts of all the the people involved to give the, the best attention uh, possible. Let me uh, see the, the part of the, the chat box. Uh, we have some uh, questions. Uh, I have a, a question from Edith. Will somebody comment on the imperative if that's the right word to not outright lie to the patient after a medical error, our physician denied any role in the action that caused an injury. We got a copy of the medical record a few weeks later from which we learned her claim was untrue. That's when the real rage at what happened began. What do you think about this? Yeah, I think, um, um... In the United States, there's no um, law um, that requires a healthcare provider to um, confess an error to a family or to provide accurate information um, if they if they know it. There's no requirement that they do so, um, and certainly. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Bleed Out, you know that a doctor will say one thing off the record and another thing on the record. Um, but um, the lies will definitely incite rage and um, distance the parties from ever reaching any kind of a resolution short of litigation. Perfect. And um, we have another question related to this deny and defend culture in the healthcare context is pervasive, and we talk about the roles of the patients and the clinicians and the roles from this. How do we actually make the necessary shift away from defensive and secretive responses to towards a relation restorative and healing response? How do we humanize the response to healthcare harm and what role do non-disclosure agreements play in this? Who, who want to answer this this question? No, I, I'd be happy to just address it. And if, or Regina, if you'd like to go ahead. I'm, I'm... Well, why don't we do it together? Sure, sure. Um, I, the thing that, um, you know, you, we have to look at is we've got, as I said, there's legislation that prevents, uh, we, we have these quality assurance reviews in, in Alberta, uh, in Canada. Uh, as Elizabeth said, they have the same sort of meetings and systemic look reviews in the US. 
um, I think one of the things we have to do is just change the legislation that allows that to, that information to be used more readily to involve patients and families in those discussions, in those meetings, um, to, to give feedback. Um, and uh, other things we, we'd have to look at is just the training. Um, for instance, I'm involved uh, here at the University of Calgary, our Cummings Medical School, working with Haskane Business School is uh, involved, it has a course on precision health and medicine, part of which is a quality safety piece. And we were able to present, I was able to speak to them in their first week and I'm continuing to work with them in their ethics and law course about, uh, about how to, to, to implement person-centered care uh, in, in, in educational roles. And so, and that's management, that's clinicians, that's even their IT people are attending these courses. Um, so I think there's certainly the educational piece, there is changing laws about keeping things quiet. Um, but even if you've been incited, for instance, as Elizabeth said, if you're not, if the doctor says one thing and privately and then tells you something else, and then you find out later and you're angry about it, there should be ways and mechanisms to still go back to the organization or to the, to the you know, whether it's the regulator, and to still get a, a, a full response where they say, well, sorry, this is, and explain why that happened to you. Um, there's a lot of stages through the process where the patient and the family's anger can be brought under control and because they're given the information they were looking for. Maybe they don't get it first initially, but they sh that, that's a process I think that needs to be put forward is bring, make it happen at any time. Anytime through this process, make sure these people are getting what they need. And if, if you fail at one stage, do it at the next step. And to add on to that, um, the one thing about non-disclosure agreements is you never have to sign one. You don't, what's your goal? Is your goal change in the world? Is your goal to stop systemic harm? Then it may be more valuable to share your story all over the world. Talk to reporters, go to meetings, um, there's oftentimes a pl place, at, place at a conference where you've got that chance to ask a question. Ask that question in front of a thousand people and watch how fast change can happen. Mm -hmm. One of the things I love about the current Open Notes project is now the narrative note is coming before the clinical um, data flow. So in that narrative note, instead of saying 64-year-old man or aggressive wife, it says Bob or Sally. It's their name. And if you name people and you actually do that, they become real again. And we have the ability through doing that to change things. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and of course we need to take an account the different countries, the, the, sorry, the different contexts of the, the countries, the, the societies and how they impact in, in the different responses of these kind of things for the a clinical part for the uh, organizations and, and for the, the patients by itself. Well, it's a valuable discussion to have about how everybody's role and how we all fit in together when it does happen. But I think we can't lose sight of the fact that it is the third leading cause of death in the United States. And that's really where the fix has to come first. Perfect. Thank you, Elizabeth. Well, this was a uh, very enjoyable. Thank you to all the panelists for being here and have this important conversation. Thanks to the Patient Safety Movement Foundation for this opportunity and also to the audience for being so engaged and join us during the webinar. If there's some questions that were on respond, uh, we will try to do it and publish uh, after, after this. I'm going to turn it over to Sara to give the final details of the webinar. Great, thank you, Luis. And just to echo what Luis said, if we didn't get to your question, um, I do see that there were a few in the chat and we'll be sure to hand those over to our panelists after this webinar and they will respond to those and we'll send that out shortly. Um, a few housekeeping items. I did just wanna remind everyone here at the Patient Safety Movement, we strive to present the highest quality educational content completely free of charge. Um, as a nonprofit that relies on donations from individuals, we do ask that you consider helping us keep these webinars going by visiting our website and donating what you can. Um, and then last but not least, just to reiterate the um, continuing education credit information, 
This webinar does um, provide one CE credit for BCPA. So please email us if you have any questions at all. If you attended the live webinar, it should take about five to seven days to process. But again, thank you so much to everyone that joined us and we hope you enjoyed this webinar and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Sarah. Good luck, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.